milk might not be what we really think it is. I mean, sure, it's milk, it's coming from a cow, but we don't look at where our milk actually comes from. We don't look at what's in our milk. And I'm not talking about additives, I'm talking the actual structure of milk. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't feel particularly great when they drink milk, whether it's GI, whether it's brain, cognitive, stuff like that. But a lot of times it just kind of gets roped up into lactose intolerance or anything like that. The reality is the proteins in milk are wildly different between the breeds of cattle. And in the United States, we consume a specific kind of milk that is starting to show signs of maybe not being the best. And that's how these things start, is we start seeing glimpses of stuff and then the science unfolds and we're like, you know, 10 years later, we're like, can't believe we were consuming that stuff, right? So we're getting to that point, we're starting to see things. And I'll explain what I mean. And I'll give sort of a, an, like an analogy here. We look at various forms of sugar, like from honey or from maple syrup or table sugar as pretty different, right? Like we know they're sugar, but they're different sources. They're totally different things. But we don't necessarily do that with breeds of cows when we're drinking milk, right? We don't investigate that. But for a lot of the world, and particularly in the United States, we're consuming milk from one particular breed of cow. And that breed of cow was really brought into place because it produced more yield. It produced more milk. But now we're starting to see that there's a difference. And the main difference is going to be the A1 and A2 varieties. These are different breeds of cattle and it changes what is actually in the milk. Let me explain more. Normal milk, as we know it, especially in the United States, is gonna contain both what is called A1 type milk and A2 milk, okay? So it's a genetic hybrid, so to speak, to produce more milk. And then you have what is called A2 milk, which produces, your A2 cattle produce slightly less of this milk. But they're very, very different, and the science is starting to show that. The biggest difference is probably the gastrointestinal effect. And there was a study that was published in Nutrition Journal, and this is very fascinating. It took 45 subjects, had them consume normal A1-type milk for 14 days, and had another group consume A2-type milk for 14 days. Then they had a washout period where they cleared everything out of their system and they switched groups. So those that did the A1 now did the A2, etc. Results were very, very interesting. A1 triggered a massive increase in post-dairy digestive discomfort, also known as PD3, whereas A2 did not. Okay, now what else? A1 variety milk, the normal milk, massive increase in inflammatory markers. A2, not worse GI function with A1, reduction in short chain fatty acids, meaning there was less of an actual probiotic microbial effect in normal milk, whereas A2 actually increased short chain fatty acid production, quite wild. Here's where it gets really interesting though. They also monitored on cognitive tests. A1 normal milk led to less cognitive performance, like slower performance and an increase in error rate whereas A2 had no negative impact. So what's going on? Well, A1 has different casein proteins. It has different proteins, and most importantly, it has a different peptide. This peptide is known as BCM7. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works. So we're starting to see, okay, clearly there's a difference. I wanna talk lactose intolerance for just a second though, because we really do say, when people have digestive issues with milk, that the problem is the lactose. And there are some people that are legitimately lactose intolerant, but we're starting to see that maybe it's less than we think. So what we saw with this study is that when subjects consumed the A1 normal milk, whether they had lactose intolerance or not, they had an increase in digestibility discomfort scores. So they were having issues no matter what, whether they were lactose intolerant or not. Then with the A2 variety, there were no digestive discomfort issues, whether they were lactose intolerant or not. What this is illuminating is that maybe the digestive issues that people deal with when it comes down to milk are less about lactose and possibly more about this BCM7 peptide or the difference in the actual proteins in the variety of milk. But let's talk about this BCM7, the peptides, the proteins, because I'm not here to demonize milk. I don't think that the dairy industry is evil. I like dairy. I don't think this is anything nefarious. I think this is a matter of, of profits, and it was just kind of simple. And when we look at BCM7, 
it's kind of nuanced stuff, so let's look at it. Simplest way to look at this first is there was a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Okay, and it gave subjects a uh, basically a, a nasal tube, so this, this tubes that went into their nasal uh, cavity all the way down into their small intestine. So they were able to kind of monitor things. And then they gave them either casein protein or they gave them whey protein. They wanted to see what would happen. Just And this is, of course, going to be with an A1 variety. They found that when they consumed casein protein, there was a massive increase in bioavailable peptides, bioactive peptides. Okay. That's not a big surprise you're consuming an animal product that's gonna probably have a peptide response. But what was really wild was a massive increase in this BCM7 peptide in particular, and such an increase in a number of peptides to the point where the scientists said that these are actually increasing to a biologically active degree, meaning that they were increasing enough to change things in the human body. So it's kind of like if you were to go to a potential, you know, doctor and do some kind of peptide therapy, right? You could say that you could get the same peptides from eating certain foods, but you need them in a concentration enough that's going to be bioactive or going to be biologically active. So you might go do BPC-157 or you know, these other peptides that, that doctors talk about. You're doing it in a high enough quantity to have an effect. Essentially, that's what we're seeing with the BCM-7 in milk. It's concentrated enough to potentially trigger a biological impact. So BCM7, why is this one particularly in the crosshairs when we're looking at like A1 variety milks? We're first gonna look at observational data and then we're gonna break it down into some more mechanistic stuff. This is how science kind of starts. You look at observational data, you look at mechanistic stuff, then you go into randomized controlled trials with humans and it all kind of unfolds. So first one, we'll look at an observational study, was looking at people that consumed high amounts of cow milk around the ages of two, compared to people that consumed high amounts of cow milk in the ages of 11 and 14. This will all make sense in a minute. What they found is that over time, people that had consumed more cow milk around the age of two ended up having a marked increase in type one diabetes later in life, type one diabetes, the autoimmune type. Whereas those that had cow milk more around the ages of 11 to 14, a higher concentration then, had less. What that is potentially observing is that maybe during really critical stages of growth, A1 type proteins or BCM7 could be influencing some kind of autoimmune thing or possibly having at least a correlation with type 1 diabetes. Again, correlation does not equal causation, but I also want to look at another study that looked at psychomotor development, which was really interesting. This study was published in Peptides. It looked at 37 people that were uh, breastfed compared to 53 people that were fed more of a cow milk formula. Okay, what they found is that the cow milk formula group ended up having significantly higher levels of BCM7, okay? And then in addition to that, they had delayed psychomotor development. Again, it's observation. Correlation doesn't equal causation but it's pretty interesting, especially when you start looking at the mechanisms, which we're gonna look at now. So there was a study that was published in Foods that looked specifically at BCM7, and it found that it had a potential immunosuppressive effect within the small intestine. Now, now this is very, very important because this would impact our tolerance to like dietary antigens and things like that. So much of our uh, immunomodulatory effects are happening within our gut. They also indicated that there is sort of a opioid-like effect of BCM7, which we could talk about addictive nature of it, we could talk about all that in a separate occasion, but what they're finding is that that opioid-like effect could have influenced glucose as well. Now this is short-term, this is long-term, especially important when you're talking about like growth and development. Maybe there's a link there with the glucose issue and type one diabetes, right? So we have to look at that, that's interesting, but there's more mechanistic data to look at. In July of 2024, in Nutrition Reviews, there was a meta-analysis that looked at a lot of different studies to look at BCM7. For one, casein-derived peptides increased DNA methylation in neuronal cells and GI epithelial cells. What this means is it was actually altering the genes, thereby changing the gene expression so that the development of these cells within our gut and even within our brain were impacted. How it impacted them, we don't know, but based on some of the cognitive stuff that we've seen, it's potentially negative. And there was a quote from this one particular study that said, BCM7 also altered the expression of several genes that are linked to gut inflammation and disease. So 
we're seeing some interesting links here. Nothing super causative, nothing super concrete, but enough to again say like, okay, if A2 milk isn't doing this and A1 is potentially, why, like, why are we still consuming a lot of A1 milk, which we'll get to in just a second. The other thing they noticed in one of the papers that was in this large review is that BCM7 can cross the blood brain barrier. That's problematic. They even saw that BCM7 can impact neuronal stem cells and even impact neurogenesis, so the growth of new neurons within the brain. This to me seems particularly important when you're talking about a developing child that's consuming a lot of milk, but it's important for all of us because now we know with newer literature that the brain can continue to grow and have neurogenesis long into our life, well into our life. So this is important for everyone, not just kiddos, right? So is it like a big mass effort to just get people to be dumb or, no, I really don't think so. Like I think that people are genuinely like pretty darn good. Like I think we wanna just help, but sometimes like production and profit, eh, that matters. We are seeing more farmers breeding into the A2 type, but the problem is that the infrastructure to develop more A2 is a lot. The A1 variety does produce more milk, but even that is somewhat up for debate. So it may have started as a production thing, but now we're seeing like, okay, it's not that much more. The issue is that if you switch from an A1 breed to an A2 breed, everything needs to change. The cows, but not just the cows, the facility, the milking tubes, the tanks, the transport, the manufacturing, it all needs to change because you can't have a cross-contamination. So with that, that's an extremely expensive undertaking. It gets really hefty really quick. So you can't just like have this massive upheaval, especially when the data just is not like screaming at you in the face that it's gonna, you know, like destroy you. It might be a slow problem, but it's not enough to really insinuate or not enough to induce massive change. There's also just a flat out lack of awareness. And unfortunately, we've seen a strong relationship between socioeconomic status and awareness of A2. This is a problem because it means that only people that have money and are of a higher like wealth class are actually even aware of this problem. And that's why like, I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, I want people to be aware of this, not because I want us to go attack big dairy. That's not what I'm saying. The point is, is that we just need to be aware. Like we have to be our own advocates and we have to choose better options. There are more companies trying to make awareness of this and trying to make change, but one of the companies that you may have seen in Target now is making a pretty big impact with this. It's a company called Pioneer Pastures and they are really paving the way with A2 milk. They are really trying to change the game. And so much so that Target got on board with it and more stores are getting on board with it because they're seeing how important this change is, especially with what our kids are potentially drinking. So it's an A2 type milk, A2 breed, that has been filtered to have 50% less sugar and 75% more protein. So theoretically, think of this. If you have something like a brand that is regular filtered milk, which there's a couple of them out there now, filtered milk, higher concentration of milk, but you're using the wrong type of dairy, you're concentrating the proteins that could be problematic, the BCM7. So with Pioneer Pastures, which you're seeing in Target, they're using an A2 type and then filtering it so you're getting good proteins and less sugar. So then you're getting all the benefit of milk with good protein without the sugar that you're normally gonna get with milk. And then they even have a protein line which is similar to, again, I'm not gonna say brands, but a brand that most people know of that was at a lot of stores that is a filtered protein drink. Pioneer Pastures has a filtered A2 protein type that doesn't have additional weird powders in it, doesn't have carrageenan, doesn't have artificial sweeteners. It's just good old fashioned A2 milk put into a delicious form. If you go to Target, you will see them. Okay? And yes, I am making a push for it because I think people need to hear this stuff. I think that BCM7 is potentially an issue. I also think that a lot of the big like hua over uh, like raw milk, for example, I don't have a problem with raw milk, but I think that when you look at the data, you find that the gut microbial effect of raw milk might just be the fact that raw milk is generally more A2 variety and not A1. So could you get potential benefits of raw milk by consuming more A2 and less A1? 
maybe not entirely, but it's certainly a movement in that direction, right? So why lots of people are saying, well, I don't have raw milk available in my state. Well, maybe just going to an A2 variety would be the way to go. If you do have a target near you, I recommend you go and you try it or go to target.com. This is the kind of thing where I'm begging people to vote with their dollars. If we vote with our dollars, then we can really make change. That's the only way things are going to work because brands and companies are not out there to necessarily be good or evil. I don't necessarily feel that way. I feel like a lot of times they're just in business. And if we vote with our dollars properly, just like we've been voting with our dollars over the last decade against lots of massive added sugars, that's making change. It is making change in the food supply. So we are really required to be doing that. So I encourage you to check them out at Target or Target.com. Now, one more important thing, when we look at overall gut health, there was a study published in Frontiers in Nutrition that had subjects consume either A1 or A2 type milk for 14 days. They found that the A2 milk caused a global increase in short chain fatty acids and an increase in a number of good bacterial colonies and strains within our gut. So we're actually seeing a change in the gut microbiome and short chain fatty acids in the gut when people consume A2 milk over A1. So when you look at this big picture, there's a reason why parts of Europe probably rely on dairy and have better quality dairy. In other parts of the world that are leaning on A1, we're having more issues with lactose intolerance, we're having more digestive discomfort, and possibly that brain fog that you get is a real thing. As always, keep it locked to here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.